Okay, uh, so welcome everybody and uh, thank you for attending lecture number 13 today about the uh, composition of matter. Uh, so uh, so here we we have we are done already with the fluids gases that what we have talked about in uh, lectures at, um, 11 and 12 uh, we spoke about the Pascal's principle and, and so on so today inshallah I'll be speaking about the uh, composition of matter and the, I will what I will do is I will just um, uh, skip the first slide I will come back to it later on uh, but I will start with the definition of matter. What's matter? So matter is anything that takes up space and has a mass. So anything that takes up space and has a mass should be considered as matter. So the chair you're sitting on now is a matter. The air is matter. The desk is a matter. The sandwich is a matter. The money is a matter and so on. Because all of them are are taking up space and they have a mass. So what about things like heat, uh, like X-rays, like uh, gamma rays? Now, are these matter? Uh, no, these are not matter. Sound, for example, these are not matter because they do not take up space. They do not have a mass. That's why we don't, uh, we don't say they are matter. Now, I have something called also pure substance. And look at the definition. It says that a pure substance is a type of matter with a fixed composition. A pure substance can be an element or a compound. So what does that mean? Now, let's say that you drink wo uh, water now, and the water you have now is called uh, pure water. So what does pure water mean? It means it, every single piece of this container contains H2O. It, there is no dust, no bacteria, no nothing else but H2O. So in this case, I call it a pure water. So what if I have a container that contains only oxygen or only nitrogen or only um, uh, hydrogen? Then again, I call it a pure substance. So you see, so a pure substance means what? It means that the composition is the same everywhere inside the container. Now, it doesn't matter if, for example, I have H2O or CO2 because for example, H2O, although it contains H and O, but it's still a pure matter. Why? Because everywhere in the container, it is still H2O. You see the idea? So it can be an element or it can be a compound, uh, but, uh, but as long as the composition is the same everywhere inside your container, then you must call it a, a pure matter. Okay, now let's speak about elements, and we know many elements, and those are the ones that we can find in the periodic table, for example, and, and, and elements can be either uh, found in nature or we can do them in the lab. Like, for example, I can find uh, iron, silver, gold, aluminum, I can find all these elements in, in nature, uh, but there are some el other elements uh, which we make them in the labs, we call them synthetic elements, and those are the elements that we make in the lab. Um, so, so if you look at the periodic table, you will see that we know maybe over 94 elements, um, and of course, no, I mean, we know 94 natural elements and about 20 elements that are synthetic that we can only find, um, we can only do in, in the lab. Okay. Now, as I told you in the chemistry part, we, we need to uh, make sure we understand the definition. Definitions are the most important thing in, in chemistry. Now, I have something called a compound. And what is a compound? A compound is a pure substance in which the atoms of two or more elements are combined together chemically in a fixed proportion. Okay, so, so, so what does that mean? It means that you have a number of atoms that are held together and those atoms are held together chemically uh, and, and 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 what does that mean like for example if you if if your uh, you, your mother uh, asks you to prepare a dish of salad for the dinner today so what you do is you get some cucumbers uh, some lattice some tomatoes and then you mix them together and you say here's the dish of salad now this is not called a compound this is called a mixture and why is that because the tomatoes and the cucumber and the lattice are not combined chemically with each other you see the idea 
So in a compound, like for example, a CO2 or CaCO3 and H2O, now all these, there's a chemical combination between the atoms. There's a chemical combination between the carbon and the two oxygen, or the calcium and the carbon and the three oxygen and, and, and so on. Now the other thing in a compound, that the atoms must, must be combined in a fixed proportion. So what does that mean? Like for example, in H2O, you must have two H and one O. You cannot have anything else, right? But in a dish of salad, you can have more cucumbers and less tomatoes or more lattice and so on, right? So, but in a compound, no, it must be in a fixed ratio or in a fixed proportion, okay? Now, please listen carefully to this statement. L listen, okay, listen carefully. Are you listening? Okay, listen carefully. So here we say that compounds are having totally different properties than the elements that make up the compound. So, so one more time, compounds should have different properties than the elements that make up the compound. So, so what does that mean? Like for example, look at this compound, which is called the table salt or the sodium chloride, NaCl. Now all of us or maybe most of us are using the sodium chloride. We put it on our food, we enjoy it all the time. It makes our food taste better. And if you don't consume much of it, then it does not really harm you. But look at it, it's NaCl, it's a sodium chloride. It's made up of sodium and chlorine. Now look at the sodium. Sodium is a metal. Anybody here can eat metals? Of course, maybe for most of us, or maybe all of us, we cannot eat metals. Metals can harm your uh, your stomach, right? And and what about chlorine? Chlorine is a toxic gas. It can kill you if you smell large amount of chlorine. It can kill you. Uh, so, but 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 when they combine, they make a compound which is called the NaCl. Then it becomes this nice table salt that we use all the time. That's why we say that compounds are having properties that are totally different than the elements that make up the compound. So as you can see here that the properties of compounds are not the same as the properties of the elements that combine to form a compound. Now the other thing is the elements that make up a compound cannot be separated by physical means. So, so what does physical means here? Physical means means not chemical means. So let's now go back to the, the, the example of the dish of salad. You prepare a dish of salad, you have some cucumbers, some lettuce, some tomatoes, and your young sister does not like to eat tomatoes. Now, are you able to remove the tomatoes for her using your hand or using a spoon from the dish of salad? The answer is yes. It means that you do not have to go to the lab and do a chemical reaction to remove the uh, to remove the tomatoes, right? But this is true in mixtures. But in compounds, you cannot do that. For example, in the CO2 or H2O, you cannot separate the carbon from the oxygen or the hydrogen from the oxygen by your hands or by a spoon, right? You have to do some chemical reactions and you run through too much trouble to be able to separate those uh, atoms uh, away from each other. Okay, let's now move on to the next topic, which is called the mixture. And what is a mixture? A mixture is a matter that is composed of two or more substance that can be separated by physical means, okay? So a mixture is what? It's something that can be separated by uh, physical means. So, so as I mentioned, let's say that you have a fruit salad or a dish of salad. You can remove the components. You can remove the uh, strawberry from uh, the apples, from the bananas, right? With your hands or with a spoon or the fork. That, that's called a physical means, okay? Now, and uh, now, let now, now, um, uh, uh, um, the the mixtures, mixtures, um, um, can be uh, separate or can be categorized into either heterogeneous mixtures or homogeneous mixture. You have to know now the difference between them. I have heterogeneous and I have the homogeneous mixtures. What is the difference between them? Now, in a heterogeneous mixture is a mixture in which different materials remain distinct. What, what does that mean? What does it mean, the word distinct? The word distinct means it can be distinguished. You can, you, can, you can see or feel the difference between them. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you have rocks and sand. Now, now can you see the difference between them? Yes. 
you have a dish of salad, you have tomatoes, cucumber, lettuce, carrots, and so on. Can you see the difference between them? Can you distinguish between them? The answer is yes. That's called a heterogeneous mixture. Okay, now one, one example of a heterogeneous mixture is a suspension. And what is a suspension? A suspension is a heterogeneous mixture made of liquid and the solid particles that settle. So, so what does that mean? Now look at this picture. You will see a beaker that contains water and you have sand inside this water. And now you, you mix them together. You mix the sand with the water. And then after a few seconds, if you, if, you stop, if, you stop, if you stop mixing, then the sand will start to settle. It will, it, will, it will go to the bottom of the container. This is what I call a suspension. So the suspension is if you have a solid and you have a liquid, you mix them together and you leave them, then the, then the, um, the solid material will fall at the bottom of the container. That's what I call a suspension. Now a good example of suspension is the river's water. Now, now look at this. If you think about any river uh, around you, um, maybe 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 you don't have a river around you here. But if you if you if you look at other countries, they have they have rivers and so on. So so if you think about the river, the river starts from a, a place where it rains a lot. They have lots of water sources, and then the river starts to run. And when the river runs, what happens is why it runs it collects with it lots of sand particles, rocks, mud, minerals, and so on. And the river starts moving faster and faster. Keep collecting those, those, uh, those particles from the river bank. And then finally, when the water of the river slows down, then it, all these solid materials start to settle. And, and they make something called the river's delta. Uh, so, 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 so again, rivers are an example of suspension. So, so let me repeat this one more time. So if you, if you look at the river, where the river water runs, then it collects with it lots of sand particles, um, um, uh, minerals, um, uh, mud, clay, and, and so on, right? And while it moves, it keeps carrying all this material with it. So once the river slows down, it starts to settle all those materials, right? Uh, so this is a suspension, right? So, so we call this the, the river's delta, where the suspension, um, uh, where, the, where, the, where the material settles uh, um, at, uh, at uh, a certain uh, piece of land or a certain part of the river. Okay. Now, next definition is called the collide. And what a collide is? A collide is a heterogeneous mixture with particles that never settles. Example, milk. Now, guys, think about milk. Milk is made up of what? Milk is made up of water, contains proteins, contains fats, right? And they are all mixed together, but they do not settle. Okay, so it's not like a, it's not like when you when you mix sand with water, the sand will settle, but the proteins and fats will not settle, right? So so um, uh, so this is so this is an example of a uh, a collide. Now a good example of collide also is the uh, formation of fog. Now all of us know that sometimes when you drive uh, early in the morning or sometimes even late at night, you see fog in, in the road and the fog can, it, it is very difficult to drive through fog because you cannot see very well through fog. So fog is made up of what? It's made up of water particles that are suspended in the atmosphere because of condensation, right? So those water particles are suspended. They do not settle, right? So this, this is another example of a collide. And by the way, when you drive through fog, it is better to turn your headlights off. You, you should not turn it on because some people, uh, because they want to see better, they turn the headlight on. But, but this is wrong, why? Right? Because, when, because as I told you, fog is made up of water particles that are suspended in the atmosphere. So once you turn the headlight on, the light will hit the water particles and it will be reflected back to your eyes. Then you will not be able to see very well, right? We call this light scattering because light will be reflected back to your eyes. So it's better when you drive through fog to turn your headlights um, off and not on. 
Now, the next thing I want to talk to you about today is called the Tyndall effect. And what's a Tyndall effect is? It is the scattering of a light beam as it passes through a collide. This is called the Tyndall effect. Now, what does the word scattering mean? Scattering, it, it means a, a reflection of light, but reflection in, in all direction, in random direction. That's, that, that's what we mean by scattering. So, so here in this picture, you can see two beakers. One is um, uh, filled with, uh, with um, uh, uh, a solution. The other one is filled with collide. Okay, so what does solution mean? Solution means you get salt and dissolve it in water, or you make a, a, a lemonade, like all these kind of, uh, kind of solution, uh, or get salt in water. This is also called a solution. But a collide is like what? It's like milk, for example. So let's say that we have two beakers, one filled with milk, and one filled with a solution like salt in water, for example. And you pass a beam of light through the two beakers. Now look what will happen. The one that contains the collide, light will be reflected out of the beaker. But the one with the solution, light will not be reflected. Light will not be scattered. And why is that? Because the collide, like milk, is made up of large particles that are suspended in the fluid and they do not settle, right? So when the light is when the light goes through this beaker, then light particles will start to scatter and you can see the light coming out of the beaker. But for the solution, because particles are very small, they cannot scatter the light as in the collide. So that's why you don't see any light um, uh, reflected out of the, of the solution. Okay, so what do we call this? We call this the Tyndall effect, which is defined as the scattering of a light beam as it passes through a collide. The scattering of a light beam as it passes through the uh, through the collide. So again, if this beaker is made out of contains milk, this one contains um, a solution like salt in water, then the milk or the collide will reflect the light and and the, the water solution will not, right? So what do I call this? I call this the uh, Tyndall effect. Okay, now the next thing is called the homogeneous mixture. And what is a homogeneous mixture is? A homogeneous mixture is a mixture in which the different materials cannot be distinguished. So if you cannot see the difference between different materials, then this one I call it a homogeneous mixture. So as I mentioned, what? salt in water, sugar in water, and so on. So now let me ask you this question. Let's say that you have a mixture of rocks and, 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 and sand. Now it is homo or hetero? Which one do you think? Exactly. So yeah, exactly. So this is called heterogeneous. And why is that? Because I can distinguish between the, 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 between the rocks and the sand. What about um, a, a fruit salad? Uh, you have a strawberry and you have, uh, let's say, bananas. Now, is this homo or hetero? Again, this is hetero, right? Because you can see the difference uh, between them, okay? So, here we say that due to the interaction between the particles, particles in a homogeneous mixture will never settle to the bottom of the container. So, so what does that mean? It means that if you have sugar in water or salt in water, after you dissolve it, you leave it on the counter, on the table, then the salt will not settle. It's not a suspension, right? And why is that? Because salt particles interact with the water particles, they go in between the, 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 the water particles and they disappear. You can no longer distinguish between the salt and the water. And one example of this is a solution. So again, solution means what? Means like salt in water, um, uh, sugar in water, and, and so on. Okay, um, so now I go back to the chart that I, I showed you at the uh, beginning of this class. And here you can see that matter can be either mixture or a pure substance, right? So as I mentioned, a pure substance is like what? It's like pure nitrogen, pure hydrogen, pure gold, pure silver, and let's call it a pure substance. Or it can also be a compound, like I can say pure H2O, pure CO2, and, and so on. 
Now, the other one, which is called a mixture, it means that you are mixing two substances together, but there is no chemical interaction between them. Uh, like, for example, tomatoes and cucumber, um, uh, cucumber and lattice, right? That's called a mixture, but there is no, there is no chemical interaction between them, and you can separate them by a physical mean. Now, the mixture can be separated into, or mixtures can be split into either heterogeneous mixtures or homogeneous mixtures. In the homogeneous mixtures, you cannot distinguish between the different components. Like, for example, what? Like a lemonade, a gasoline, and a steel. Now, all these are mixtures, and you cannot separate, or you, can, you cannot distinguish between the different components. And for the heterogeneous mixture, uh, like dirt, like blood, like milk, now this, the one that you can distinguish between the uh, different components. Now the pure substance could be either element or a compound. Element is like what? Like hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, um, uh, carbon, and so on. And a compound means what? Means you have two or more elements that are chemically combined like CO2, H2O, baking soda, sugar, salt, and, and so on. Now, there is something that's very important here that we have to understand. Now, let's say, for example, um, someone asks you about blood. Is blood homogeneous or is it a heterogeneous? Now, some people will say blood is homogeneous. And why is that? Because if I take some blood from my hand now, um, you will see that I cannot distinguish between the different blood components. I just see one uh, kind of uh, homogeneous liquid and it's so, some people say it's homogeneous. But other people will say no, blood is not homogeneous because if you go to the clinic or to the hospital, they can easily separate blood components. They can easily see the difference between them, between the uh, plasma and the red blood corpuscles and, and, and so on, right? So it's heterogeneous. So now which one is correct, homo or hetero? Again, this is a kind of a confusion, but your textbook is saying that the blood is heterogeneous. And, and, and please try to stick to this fact that blood is heterogeneous based on our textbook. That doesn't mean that other people are wrong or the book is right. I'm just telling you what is in your book. So when you go to exam, then probably uh, you will get the right answer. If someone asks you about blood, is it homo or is it hetero? Now, the other thing that may be, co may be confusing, like uh, those um, um, uh, Pepsi or Coca-Cola cans, uh, uh, you know, we know that a Pepsi or Coca-Cola is made up of water and carbon dioxide and some flavors and so on. So if I ask you, is this homo or hetero? Um, uh, again, some people will say it's homo, some people will say it's hetero. And the fact is, before you open the can, it is homogeneous because everything is mixed together. You cannot distinguish between them. But if you open the can, then the gas particle, the CO2, starts jumping out of the container. Now you can distinguish between the gas and the liquid. So in this case, it becomes a heterogeneous. So please try to pay, to, to, uh, to pay attention to those examples at the bottom of this chart because sometimes we'll see questions about them in, in exams. Okay, so now I'll stop talking for about uh, two or three minutes. I will come back soon, inshallah. So I hope you guys are enjoying those online lectures. I, I see like many of you are able to um, uh, view them online and this is, this is great. So hopefully we can uh, benefit out of those lectures and the online questions that we do all the time. Okay, so Let's let's go back and and here there is a, a picture in your in your textbook and this this picture is important as I told you in chemistry pictures are important please don't ignore 
uh, pictures in the chemistry. Now we have uh, we have picture of four elements. What are they? I can see the titanium, the silicon, the americium, and the magnesium. Titanium, silicon, americium, and magnesium. Now, what I need to, to know here from these pictures, I need to know the name of these four elements. I also need to know their properties because in the exam, they can ask you about those properties. So let's see. First one, titanium. Titanium is strong and lightweight and is used for bone or joint replacement and aircraft construction. In rare instances, titanium panels are used in buildings construction. So here, they told us that titanium is strong. It's also lightweight element. It is used in bone and joint replacement. And sometimes we use it in building construction. So maybe in the exam, he will, he will tell you that uh, um, an element that is strong, lightweight, and used in, um, in a bone replacement. What is this element? Is it copper or gold or silver or titanium, you see? So you must know the, the properties. You must memorize those properties of titanium to be able to answer uh, such kinds of questions. Now, the other element is called the silicon, and it presents in sand as silicon dioxide. Uh, silicon is used to make window glasses as well as silicon chips that run computers. So, so if you live in a country that has lots of stamps, you must have lots of silicon. And this silicon is used to make those solar panels, uh, that the one that we use to get the energy from the sun. And they also use to make the computer chips. So the computer that you are using now contains chips uh, or parts that are made up of the silicon. And the next element is called the americium, or sometimes called the americium. And the americium is a synthetic element. You see this word is called synthetic. The word synthetic means a man-made element. Remember when I told you at the beginning of this class that some elements we can find in nature and other elements are man-made. Now this, this element, which is the americium, is a man-made, is a synthetic element, and it is also a radioactive element. It means that it emits alpha or beta or gamma. And indeed, this, this element, the americium, is emitting beta particles, and it is used to make those smoke detectors. You know, if you are in a, in a room, and, and, and there's a fire, then, then in, 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 in houses we have those small smoke detectors. So, so, the, so the alarm will, will, will set off if, the, if there is lots of smoke, right? So it works because uh, it uses this element called americium uh, in those smoke detectors. Uh, now the last element, which is called the magnesium, and the magnesium is um, a, a, a chlorophyll, the substance that makes plants green, contains magnesium. So if you look at these green plants, they contain magnesium because they contain chlorophyll, and chlorophyll contains the magnesium. Now, magnesium is a lightweight, strong, and has resistance to corrosion. So what does the word corrosion mean? Like, for example, if you have a piece of iron and you leave it in the air, in the water for a long time, then it starts to make rust, right? You know, this brown layer on the iron, which we call rust, rusting, right? So this rusting is a kind of a corrosion, right? So corrosion means the interaction of weather or wind or, or water and so on with elements. So it removes parts of those elements or those metals, that's what we call corrosion. So the good thing about magnesium, it has a high resistance to corrosion, so it does not corrode easily. That's why they use it to make airplanes, engines, um, and also uh, because it has a lightweight and it's a strong element, so it has all this co combination of, uh, of properties that makes it very good to make those uh, jet engines or airplanes engines. Okay. Now, if you if you look at if you if you go to your textbook and you go to the next page, uh, you will find two more elements. And what are these two more elements? One of them is called the lead (Pb), and the other one is the aluminum (Al). Now, these are very important elements as well. Uh, so, so for for the lead, 
Now, if, now you guys know, like, if you go to a dentist and you, you try to make a panorama x-rays on your teeth, usually the dentist put, uh, puts a, a jacket, like um, a heavy jacket on your chest, right? Now, this jacket is heavy because it contains lead. And why lead? Because lead, um, because lead can, can, can um, protect you from the x-rays because the doctor does not want your body to be exposed to x-rays. That's why they use this lead jacket or lead vests. Okay, so lead is good because it can um, protect us against radiation. So let's say that you guys, after your graduation, you work in a place that you know it has um, uh, radiation, alpha or beta or gamma. So let's say that you work in a nuclear reactor, for, ex for example, and, and or a nuclear lab, and you know that the room or the lab next to you contains radioactive element that emits alpha or beta or gamma. So the question is, how can I protect myself against those harmful radiation? Should I use concrete? Should I use um, uh, paper? Should I use uh, aluminum? What should I use? The answer is you need to use lead because lead is the only thing that can protect you uh, from those harmful radiation. Even if you go to a hospital, uh, if you break your legs or uh, your leg or your arm and you go to make an x-ray in the hospital, you will see on the wall of the hospital, they say that this wall is shielded against radiation uh, because they have lead installed on those walls because they don't want the x-rays to harm people who are uh, waiting to do the x-rays. Now, finally, we can talk about the last element, which is called the, uh, the aluminum. And aluminum is a, a very common element because we use it in many, many applications. Like we can use it to do automobiles, bicycles, uh, even the wires. Even in cooking, we have those cooking pans and, and, and pots. Some of them are made up of aluminum, right? So aluminum, because it because you can bend it, you can, uh, you, you can hammer it, you can uh, make wires out of it, and then that's why it's a very useful element. So, so here we have six elements that I want you to know very well. I have the titanium, silicon, anertium, magnesium, lead, and iron. You must know their names, their properties, and, and their applications. Okay, so I guess I will just stop here at this uh, topic. And we'll see you next class, inshallah. Thank you so much.